Thanks for the socks. I got these socks uh, from Susie when she cleaned out the desk. Uh, so that's uh, some pure love there. Thank you. It's my favorite ones. All right. I could think of no better recipient for these socks than Eric. Um, so we're going to have a discussion. We're going to have a few people on stage who are going to give um, their insight. But this is an open discussion. So please, any questions, any thoughts, any input that you have, feel free. Uh, to add it. Uh, my name is Susie Hoban. As Eric mentioned, I work for Nordic Approach. Um, some of you may know I'm actually uh, fairly recent to specialty coffee. So before I moved to Norway in January last year, I lived in Colombia and I worked in cacao and chocolate. So I worked with fine cacao and craft chocolate, which is the chocolate world's equivalent of specialty coffee. But if uh, specialty coffee is, say, a toddler in the world of, um, of profile definitions, of coffee evaluation, of price, uh, uh, price setting mechanisms, and wine might be considered a teenager, well, cacao and chocolate is a baby. Um, in the world of cacao, there is no one system of evaluation. So at this point in time, a producer of fine cacao could send their samples to five different chocolate makers and get five completely different um, results, feedback back from those people. So there is no way for a cacao producer to even know if they're producing quality. So in the chocolate world, there are many people who are working to try and uh, create a fairer system. And always we were looking to specialty coffee as the model because there are so many similarities between cacao and coffee. They're both grown in uh, the developing world in tropical countries transformed into a consumable product uh, in the developed world where the um, product is consumed. And pretty much every website of every specialty coffee importer and roaster has the words transparency, sustainability, traceability. So I came to specialty coffee thinking, excellent, this is all sorted out. This is going to be so easy. And I turn up and I am shocked at how little we actually know. I couldn't believe that we didn't know the actual price paid to the farmer for every single coffee that we had. And I thought, well, this is simple. We just ask the farmer, and then we publish that number, right? Seems really simple, right? It doesn't seem like it needs to be this complicated. But of course, the more I learned, the less I know. And the further we delve into this, the harder it gets. So at Nordic Approach, in the last few months, we have been having professional and respectful, intense discussions about transparency. Everybody wants to be fully transparent. Everybody in the team wants to publish as many numbers, as much data as we can possibly publish. But these numbers have to be understood in context. So we constantly are going around about what is the actual interpretation of these numbers? Uh, how do we publish these numbers? How do we communicate? to our roasters who, quite frankly, are not particularly concerned about the complexities of the supply chain in Ethiopia when it's two degrees outside and it might rain, so what does that mean for my roast profile today? Yeah, that's your job as roasters. Our job as importers is to understand the supply chain. How do we communicate that to you in a way that you can understand within the couple of minutes that you've got to spend on this today uh, without oversimplifying it and therefore misrepresenting the numbers? So uh, I would like to invite Morten from Nordic Approach, Tim from Tim Benderboa, and Susanna from Al Grano onto the stage. As I said, we're going to have some questions I'm going to pose to the people up here, but we, this is a discussion with everybody in the room. Fortunately, it's a nice uh, compact room, so we should be able to hear. And for the purposes of the video, I can repeat any comments or questions, or I can run to you with uh, this microphone. Is uh, Jacques coming as well? Yes, oh, yes please. please. And uh, Eric, if you want to join. Great. I've just invited some more. <laughs> it's a big party. There's one more. <laughs> Come up, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You sit, okay. sit in the room here. <laughs> We're all going to get very cozy. Can everyone more see everyone on the stage? Excellent. OK. So maybe I'll put the question first to, to Belko. I'm about to fall off the stage, tangled in uh, cables here. Okay. 
Um, maybe I'll put the question first to, to Belko. What, is, uh, what discussions are you having in the office about transparency? And do you see this as something very simple that we should be tackling now, or do you see it as something more complicated? It is something very complicated. So we have somebody working on it every day, uh, one researcher. So it's, to us, it's connected to sustain sustainability. So the problem is, as you said, is to give uh, raw data, raw numbers. You have always, it's more the way you interpret than the number itself. So, and from, uh, you need an approach very local, meaning you need to be close to the source, to the origin. So you will not talk uh, about transparency in Ethiopia like you talk in Brazil or like you talk in Colombia. So this is the main difficulty. We need to, we need to understand uh, a very a lot of local context, and we need to give the information to the to the roasters. So it's not easy. I think it's not possible to give a, a model like a magic box where you put some number and then you you come up with a solution. So it's all about, uh, but which is good for uh, for us and for for the specialty rosters because this give a kind of um, uh, you need some knowledge. You need to you need to pay attention. You need to spend time on this, and uh, this is a way to differentiate your product from the big industry, from the big uh, big roster. Yeah. Great, um, Morton. Do you have any thoughts? And the complexity of uh, of transparency. Why it's why why haven't we yet cracked a system of uh, displaying transparent price data? Yeah, I mean, uh, I very much agree with you. Um, it's complicated. I mean, FOB price, which is kind of now out there, it's that's a pretty clear number. And uh, I also want to say, I mean, that's. Uh, can I go with this now? The FOB thing? Yeah. So I mean, that's that's you know, like that's a huge step, and it's like really important, um, because what the industry need, or let's say what our part of the industry need, is kind of a new, let's say, um, benchmark for how we're gonna price quality coffee and specialty coffee, looking apart from the C price. Yeah. So I think uh, that's where we're at now. Tim has been doing this for a while. Um, there's uh, there's the pledge that uh, you can talk about later, but you know like that's like that's a uh, that's the most important thing, because we have to differentiate different differentiate ourselves from you know like the commercial industry, and we also need to put awareness of pricing of the coffee for the consumer for the sake of the consumer, and people should feel it when they're paying a lower price, and they should know what the kind of coffee is worth. But like you said, and what you're saying, when you're trying to look at what the FOB price actually means, it gets very complicated. Because the hu supply chain is huge. And in some places like Ethiopia, for instance, there's so many layers, and people are adding value in so many places of the supply chain. Um, and it's also not always clear, you know, like who's the actual farmer, what's the exporter, What's the farmer? What's the difference? Is it like one exporter farmer altogether? Do you have like different companies? Where do they channel the money? The money can be channeled in a way to reduce taxes related to local politics, for instance. So that's why, you know, like it's it's difficult. But um, I think it's possible. Um, and the other thing is that we have to find a way to compare, you know, like if you look further down, the supply chain from the FOP price, we have to look, we have to find a way to compare apples to apples, meaning like when the coffee get paid for parchment or cherries, what does that actually mean? Yeah. Okay, so so coming back to FOB, everyone in the room is familiar with FOB as a term, right? It means free on board, and it is the price that an importer is paying to an exporter, or basically the value of the coffee as it passes from the dock and onto the ship, yeah, to be transported. So Tim, uh, you were one of the roasters behind uh, the pledge, or one of the motivating forces behind the pledge, and the focus of the pledge is on FOB numbers. So can you talk about why you chose FOB and what does that actually represent? Well, I have to correct you a little bit. I didn't choose anything. Uh, 
I was asked uh, very, or right before they launched the pledge to kind of be part of it. <clears throat> so it was already kind of done. Uh, but since I already ha were displaying my numbers, it was very easy to join. <clears throat> and they've invited me to be a part of it, but I never had the time to, <laughs> to participate, unfortunately. But uh, coming back to FOB price, I think uh, quite uh, strange to start talking about another price. It doesn't mean that it's the ultimate price uh, benchmark, uh, because FOB just means that the coffee is delivered on a boat. Um, and as Morten we were talking about, there's a lot of people from there, if you go backwards, a lot of people charging money for transportation, milling, whatever. So the farm gate price uh, is probably a better price to know if the farmer was paid well, but also a farm gate price can also be for cherries and, and for parchment. So it's complicated, I, I would say, but um, uh, at least there's kind of a, you have the C price where you can kind of compare. And uh, I think we just need to uh, acknowledge that the C price, this, that C is for commodity. And that's it's for coffees below 80 points. And that's the kind of, uh, when they say the cost of production, for instance, in Colombia is uh, $1.25 per pound. But that's for commodity coffee. So if we want to talk about something uh, special where the farmer has done some extra work, um, we cannot even think about the C price because there is more costs involved in picking and processing and storage and milling and even the exporters, because their smaller volumes are more expensive, everything is more expensive. So, but the FOB price, I think, is a good measurement. And uh, uh, instead of criticizing, because the pledge has gotten a lot of criticism because it's only displaying FOB price, but at least we're displaying something. And the industry, our industry, part of the industry, has been talking about the importance of transparency for as long as I've been working in it, but nobody's doing it. And uh, I mean, how many people think transparency is important? Yeah? And how many of you are actually displaying your price? That tells me a lot. And I'm not saying you have to, but uh, you know, th this is uh, uh, the kind of stone in the shoe, I think, in our industry. And I think the pledge was created to encourage more people to do it because it's not dangerous to do it. Like It's not like uh, Eric is going to look at my uh, pricing and say, oh, I'll, I'll visit those farmers and just pay one cent more. Or like, this is what people are afraid of. But that's not the reality, I think. So FOB is the number we have. Right, so we, this is the number that we can start with, but I think we all agree that FOB is not giving us the information we want, and the information most of us want to know is what did the farmer get paid? And often that is expressed in terms of farm gate. You know, what is the farm gate price? So, um, Morten, maybe you can talk a little bit about farm gate. What does farm gate even mean? Yeah, um, that's uh, kind of the problem. Um, so I guess for most people, uh, it would mean that, you know, like it should display what the, let's say the producer or the farmer actually get paid, you know, like when you remove the added cost from the export FOB price, you know, meaning like you said, milling, transport, uh, all that, you know, like it's supposed to display what, what the farmer actually gets paid. The thing that we're looking at is, you know, like where the value is added. And like I said, there can be like very complicated, um, yeah, there can be very complicated supply chains and also complicated ownerships. So, I mean, you have a producer or a farmer, sorry, that harvests the cherry. That farmer may or may not have its own mill. And sometimes, even if, or I mean, beneficial like a wet meal. Sometimes, even if, in, for marketing purpose, you will say that this farmer is, you know, like he have his trees, he have his wet meal, he have uh, even like maybe his export company. The thing is that that can be totally different entities. So if I'm looking at my supply chain, for instance, I could take one example in Colombia, where uh, a farmer in Antioquia called Juan Saldariaga. The farms itself, I mean, when you go there, it looks like you have a farm and a mill. 
but the farm, the land, is actually owned by him and some other family members. And then the mill is owned by him and his father. So he's actually buying his cherries from his kind of family farm, adding value, processing it, you know, at the beneficio. And then he's separating, you know, like the lots and present them to us. Um, and he might bring them to his mill uh, or he buy that service for the milling purpose, just removing the parchment. And then he will, because he's also like having an export license, he will pay for the transporter to, to port and ship it to us. It could be very easy for me to say that what we're paying FOB is what we pay to the farmer. Because he's kind of having the trees, the wet mill, the export company. But it's really the money is channeled down to his different entities. And also he's looking at the tax kind of um, the tax uh, regulations to see where should I make the profit? Should I make the profit at the farm level? One year it might make sense because that's where he can reduce his taxes the most. Taxes in Colombia can be like crazy if you don't know where to, to you know, like make your profits. So that's why I'm saying, I mean, for marketing purposes, like I said, FOB price is kind of farm gate, basically, because he looks like the, he's the producer. But to us, that's not really true. So, but my question is, I still don't know what should I refer to as the farm gate price for him, because I don't know whether it's going to be on the, you know, like the wet mill level, or is it going to be on the farm level? Or whatever so and maybe it's not so important what we have to just focus on is like trying to display where the value is added like we're doing here uh, and i'm not sure if it in the end is very important who's making you know like what it's more the awareness that there is a lot of cost included and uh, you know like even if we know exactly what they get paid we don't really even know what what impact that have but we do know that, okay, he's getting, he's making, or he's getting paid at this level and at this level and at this level. So, yeah, I think um, that's, uh, yeah, it's kind of complicated, but maybe we are also making it too complicated. But the thing with Farmgate, I don't know, for us at least, I think we're talking about not maybe using that as a term and try to figure out another way to, you know, like showcase well, where the value is added and what we're paying. And, or if we're paying an FOB price, how we can actually, let's say, estimate the, the, the kind of the channel of the money. Yeah. Um, so on that, a question for Belco. Obviously, there is uh, a lot of work to transform a coffee cherry into green that can be exported and that is different in every country. So how do you approach talking about farmer prices in different origins, like comparing Brazil to Ethiopia, to Colombia? Um, the first thing, is we, we do have an agency in Addis. So we have people there, we are five. Myself, I've managed the, um, the office in, uh, in Addis Abeba. So the first thing we have to know, we have to do is to, it's, it's to understand the supply chain. So. In, uh, in, in Ethiopia, or in, it's not more difficult than in Brazil to understand. Just you need to spend time and to, I suppose you are fast or slow, but <laughs> so the, the, the first thing to do is to, is to understand this supply chain. One thing I would like to, I agree with uh, Morten, it's impossible to know where is the value and what does it mean? Because maybe for a milling, a miller, it's, uh, you have to, how can I know the, the fair price, for example. It's going to a lot of detail, it's going to a detail I cannot approach. And uh, just to, uh, I think there is also a cultural bias for you, like uh, Scandinavian roasters, transparency means something. It's a good thing. For example, I am a Latin, I'm French, it's not the same. It doesn't mean the same. So, we have to be, when we approach a reality in a country, we have to 
first of all, we have to understand the people, the culture. So it's not like I'm jump out of a plane and uh, slap the guy on the, the face, okay, give me your numbers. Uh, no, no, you, you give uh, 10 cents to him, not give him 20. This is not my job. Uh, so the first thing is to understand the people who work with it. Uh, for the example of Ethiopia, they are like, uh, I think uh, farming coffee for uh, 30, 40, 50 generations, maybe 1,000 years. They export coffee since the uh, 9th century. So they, are, they have some knowledge, they have some uh, attitudes, and it doesn't belong to me to, to change it. And for me, the transparency is to explain you frankly uh, <clears throat> where are the problems and uh, not to judge in a way like this is good, this is bad. This is very important. Uh, so first we need to understand the people. We need to understand the, the culture of the, of the business. And then we can try to, because the goal of this is to make everybody in the chain uh, able to live from their work. So I would say the first attitude is to say, okay, when I talk to somebody, first question, do you make money when, I, when you are selling me at this price? And this exercise, sometimes it's, uh, I realize it's not so easy to answer. People, they start to think, they sit, and they calculate, and I didn't, no, 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 I, I, I didn't think I had to go down, you know, it's like, okay, I told you like uh, $3, but finally I realized I might have to make three twenty, Just because this exercise is not so easy to do, and it's not a reflex, you know? So, so it's, uh, we have to, to have a personal approach, uh, knowing as much as possible the culture of the country, of the business over there, of the farmers. Um, and then it's always difficult to interfere inside the business. And we have to be very, I would say, uh, delicate, you know? To, and yeah. We, we try to respect all the... And one thing more, um, in the chain, I think in the good chain, all the actors, they, are, they do a job. So they need also to make money. And, and uh, so it's, the farmer is not somebody like uh, innocent, an innocent, innocent people and who, with uh, the victim of a system, it could, it could be a part. But, uh, but the problem for a farmer is you have a limited capacity to produce. It's a farming business. So you cannot extend as, uh, your production as you can do as a roaster. Uh, if you want to sell more, it's possible to buy more coffee, to find more coffee, and to double your production, triple, double. For a farmer, you have a limit, which is the nature of uh, where you are. And this is also important to understand. Uh, um, so you raise an interesting uh, point about the cultural differences and how they impact our understanding of transparency and the value we place in transparency. Cafe Imports is a US-based importer. You have uh, your European offices. What are your roasters asking and how do you think um, being a US-based company is impacting the way that you see transparency and the data you should be publishing? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's a cultural thing. Um, I mean, I definitely see more interest in closer, okay, more interest in FOB pricing here in Europe than in the States, though it is a global kind of question. And we've also been going through exactly the same discussions, kind of working out where we stand on things and where we don't. Um, and I think, I feel like I'm up here to play the devil's advocate. So I'm sorry to like, uh, to be that guy, but you know, the more and more I talk with my colleagues about it and the more and more we talk as a company, the more it feels like the FOB price is a thing that gratifies the roasting community and no one else. Um, I see no consumers really asking for it. I see like down at the bottom level or really understanding what it means. I feel like there's so many issues with why it doesn't actually convey real meaning, you know, $3 today in Brazilian hay ice is different from six months ago and six months ahead. So it's a, it's a point in time. It's, it's also like what we pay our exporters, what those exporters choose to make. I know there's coffees I've seen that 
cost one amount from a certain exporter and the same coffee from the same farm costs a very different amount. And I'm not saying one is right and one's wrong, but there's so many holes that it feels like maybe it's not really helping. And I do think it's good. I do think it's good that people want to make a change. And I think that's really important. But um, yeah, as a company, we've kind of ended up, we're still going through these discussions and and I think we really want to work out what's the best thing for our partners at Origin. Um, and one interesting example that I think I never thought about until quite recently and actually came up this week was that we have one particular supplier actually in Ethiopia, a large, large uh, producer. And one of their big end customers wanted to know the FOB price. And we spoke, we asked the exporter, we asked the producer, and they said they weren't happy for us to share it. So in that situation, um, you know, are you then excluding those people from trading with people in the pledge? Are you excluding, you know, it, it's a really interesting thing. You have, has anyone actually stopped to think what the exporter wants, what the farmer wants? Is anyone actually talking to them about it? And some people don't mind. Some farmers are really happy and some people aren't. So that's, we're kind of in a gray zone and it's a really uncomfortable place to be as a business, to be honest. It'd be really great to be like, this is what we're doing, but we're taking the slow route and trying to work out what the right thing is. Um, so Susanna, you work for El Grano and El Grano has a very different business model and transparency was really you know, baked into the business model from the start. Can you talk a little bit about how... Yeah, I'm going to move just a bit so I can see what I... Screenshots I took. Um, so a lot of you were... Um, at the cupping a few days ago. Um, so yeah, I'm Susanna from Algrano. Um, so basically Algrano is a platform that was launched in 2015 to bring together uh, growers and roasters. So this is a screenshot from, uh, from our platform, uh, from the grower map. Um, so there's already six, uh, over 600 um, producers um, on, the, on the platform. So our idea is really to um, facilitate direct trade and have a marketplace for, for um, growers and roasters. Um, so these are a few of the coffees that we copped uh, a few days ago. Uh, so this is from, from the platform as well. Um, so as you can see, there's the uh, farm gate price um, and then uh, information about each coffee lot. And then when you select a coffee lot, then you have the uh, full cost breakdown. So this, uh, the first one there, BR202 from uh, Sun Coffee. <laughs> That's the coffee that we're going to have a look at. Uh, so just as an example, um, this is what we show on the platform. Uh, so there's the farm gate price, um, then uh, the exporting, um, freight and import, financing, and um, then in this case, the Algrano margin. Um, and basically, uh, how we work is that this is fully uh, commission-based, uh, the Algrano margin. So you can select uh, the financing and the um, freight and import. So basically, the logistics um, is customizable. So when you select the logistics that you want, either FCA, DDP, FOB, uh, and so on, and then the financing that you want, so whether you want to pay straight away or after delivery, then this cost breakdown is updated. So our idea is really like to be fully transparent and um, there is a lot of uh, work behind the platform uh, and it's automatically um, uh, doing the, the cost breakdown. So as a roaster, you can see when you're on the platform. So that's our idea. So really to be fully transparent um, and uh, the growers are themselves on the platform. Uh, in some cases we work uh, with cooperatives, so depending, of course, on, on origin as well. So, yeah, this is, in a nutshell, how we work, and it's, yeah. So can I just ask you, on this slide here, you've got uh, $7.72 USD per kilo at Farmgate. How are you defining Farmgate? What is the farmer delivering? Yeah, so uh, in this case, um, the exporter that we're working with, um, or the cooperative, it's Sun Coffee, so it's shown there. Um, however, here, 
uh, the value that shows farm gate is really uh, to the producer. Um, and then the share that Sun Coffee, so the exporter has, is then the exporting row. Um, so that's how, how this uh, is, is shown. Uh, and then the freight and import is um, everything that has to do with the logistics then from, in this case, from Brazil to, to Bremen or then uh, to the roastery. Uh, and to Stuart's point about these businesses at origin not necessarily wanting to share uh, details about how they run their company, especially if it affects their ability to be competitive, uh, how did you deal with this with your export partners? Uh, sorry? How? So uh, some companies, at, especially we have suppliers who are very wary of sharing their numbers because they work in very competitive um, origins and they fear that if they show how they break down the costs of their coffees, then they're giving away their business model to their competitors. Well, I mean, our whole business model is to, to provide transparency and uh, facilitate direct trade. So as I mentioned, our, our commission, which is so shown there, it's based on the services that we provide. So it's really based on uh, the logistics and financing that the roaster, roaster wants. So of, of course we want to be transparent about it and um, on our platform it's it's really the uh, the producers that are signing up to the to the platform um, so for them it's as well it's uh, fair fair that they know exactly uh, how much each uh, player is getting and, and our whole idea is to really kind of not simplify the supply chain but make it lean so so really having the parts that are necessary to get that coffee fresh from a region to, to your roastery. Yes. Um, yeah, let me just repeat the question. So the, the question is a fundamental one, and that is why should we be transparent? What is the end goal of transparency? Uh, for us, it's really to empower the farmer. So uh, we've been talking about sustainability, really, you know, long-term thinking, uh, how to how to empower um, those, um, you know, farmers, producers. Um, so that's the reason um, that we're doing it. And because of technology, uh, I mean, um, for example, with the, the producers that Sun Coffee is working with, um, like they're using WhatsApp. So I mean, there's so much that technology now uh, enables us to do. And, and um, yeah, farmers are, and producers, they're ready to, to you know, communicate with roasters and, and have that uh, dialogue also about you know what they can do better and how to price their coffee and, and yeah great we that is a really interesting question and I really wish we had more time to get into it but we are running out of time uh, but I do uh, I do want to ask one question uh, to Eric I think one of the reasons why we are pushing for transparency is because we all agree that farmers need to be paid more that this is unsustainable farmers are not earning enough for the work that they're doing to produce the coffee. Um, but the question, of course, is who should be paying more? And every person, every player within the supply chain is arguing, ourselves included, we're squeezed, we can't, you know, we can't pay more and then have our customers continue to pay the same prices. So the question is who should pay more? And should it be the end consumer? Eric, at Kaffa, you have a really interesting project with Remetusen, which is a supermarket chain here in Norway and you are roasting very high quality coffee and selling it at a very competitive price. How is that possible? And how does that it's benefit not. the farmer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so the background was that the supermarket came to us and they are known for pushing prices down. I mean, it's, they, they exist to, because they can have lower prices on food than their competitor. And they came to us with an idea of, okay, we can have lower prices, but we can still do high quality. And within that segment, we can be the lowest price. Okay. So, uh, and um, we, I mean, I didn't have any experience of that. So I tried to like figure out how many bags would they want to buy and how much could I press my prices because of larger scale. So in our case, we're, talk we're talking about doubling or maybe even tripling the, the volume we were producing. And in that way, we could lower the, the percentage that the rent and staff and 
me what I what I cost and everything. And the idea was that we could sell it cheaper, lower price to them. And of course, what's interesting with an actor like that is that they are adding much lower margins than anyone else. I mean, if we sell to a coffee bar, they have to double the price to pay the rent. When we sell to to in this case, they take transportation and storaging is ten percent. And uh, the stores need 20%, you know, margin or 25 maybe if in coffee is a bit higher. So in that we can actually charge quite a similar price to what we charge other customers. Uh, but the end, the price to the end consumer is, is much lower because of their margins, not because of ours or anything else. We also said that we, we would have everyone's eyes on us to what do we actually pay for the coffee? So we decided we're gonna pay the same, we're gonna pay, pay the same quality, but just to make it very clear to the consumer, why are they paying more? Because maybe not all of the end consumer would understand that they were drinking a coffee that costed 370 FOB, paying seven, eight, nine dollars for a bag of coffee. So, uh, so what we said that we have to figure out the marketing thing, how can we, and, and Robert, that's the owner of Coffee, he said, okay, you can, you can be, have a lower price from, out from the roastery, they can sell it cheaper, but we, I want to pay more farm gate than what we do with everyone else. So we had to figure out how do we do that and how do we get the consumer to understand that they're actually paying more. So we decided we're adding $1 per every kilo of green coffee, and then we put that on a bag. So that ends up like two Norwegian crowns per bag to the worker, we said. Because Farmgate, what is that? We didn't know in different countries there would be different things. And if we would pay the money in front when we bought the coffee, that was the, like, the idea from the beginning. But then everyone would add their percentage, right? That $1 would become $5 before it ended up in the store. So yeah, we tried to figure that out. So we, what we actually is that we're paying for some of the coffees, we're paying four seventy dollars for a coffee that per kilo. Uh, and then we sell it for nine dollars in the store it's not easy but i think it's at least it's interesting to see how that that uh, can it's possible though it's possible to scale higher prices fob and to actually pay more but i think to answer your question we need to get the consumer into that so maybe they're paying just two crowns per bag extra for this extra project project but what they're really paying more for is everything else the quality and for us to do it and for to our importers and exporters to do their important work. So, yeah. so we ask the consumer to pay a little bit more and the rest of the benefit comes from us being more efficient. But we trick them to chain. buy quality because they think they're just doing a good, a fair trade thing, but they actually get quality on it. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, this is all we have time for. Our uh, amazing team have the next cupping set up and ready to go. This is a very um, complicated subject and I'm sure that there are questions and thoughts that we can continue in our coffee break and lunch and dinner tonight. Thank you very much uh, to our panelists for coming up on stage at uh, sometimes three minutes notice uh, this morning and thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.